everyone. I am Andy Anderson. My partner Ike Allen and I are the co-owners of Avai University. Thank you so much for joining us. In this event, as you know, we're talking with really incredible fellow experts. We're talking with therapists, psychologists, doctors, and more. And they're here to provide you with tools and strategies, ultimately to help you experience greater happiness, greater peace, and joy in your life. Today, our guest is going to talk about overcoming depression and anxiety using something called the Change Triangle Tool for Emotional Health. So please welcome Hillary Jacobs Hendel. Hi, Hillary. Hi. Hi, Andy. It's so great to be here. It's so great to have you here. I can't wait to talk all about this change triangle and really dive into this topic on emotions. I'm going to first tell um, a little background about you and your work before we before we get started. So for those of you who don't know Hillary, she is an emotion educator, as well as a psychoanalyst and experiential trauma therapist in private practice. She is the developer of the Change Triangle, which is a science-based tool for emotional health. She's also the author of the award-winning self-help book on how to work with emotions. And that book is called It's Not Always Depression, Working the Change Triangle to Listen to the Body, Discover Core Emotions, and Connect to Your Authentic Self. She has published articles in the New York Times, Time, Oprah, Salon, and Professional Journals. Hillary also consulted on the psychological development of characters on AMC's Mad Men. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, and Hillary's blog on emotions and how to use them for well-being is read worldwide. So could you just give us a kind of overview of how, how you got to be doing the work that you do today? What's your background? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, and it's both professional and very, very personal. Um, later in life, after several careers, my first one being a dentist, which is only important in that I had a great education in, in, the, in the whole human body. Mm -hmm. uh, through going to the first two years at Columbia Medical, Stu uh, Columbia Medical School with medical students and learning a, a full medical education and then going on to become a dentist, even though I didn't like dentistry and I left and searched and searched, um, that education really influenced what I'm doing today. And so at the age of 39, I decided I, want to be a psych I wanted to be a psychotherapist and I went back to social work school to get a master's. And then was about to enter into psychoanalytic training because in New York City, that is the sort of creme de la creme of how to um, be considered uh, highly educated in, in the field of psychotherapy. Um, and at about the same time, I stumbled on, a, uh, on an entire body of science that had to do with emotions and the body and how to heal anxiety and depression, not just medicate it away or not use uh, techniques that are closer to CBT in nature, which are very helpful, but this was about really how to, how to change the brain and how to heal the brain and the mind and the body. And what I learned blew me away. It changed my mental health immediately. This, that's the first time I saw this, this triangle, which I adapted from the scientific literature for the public. Because as I began to practice this new type of therapy that I can touch on if you want called AEDP, mm -hmm. uh, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy, it was an attachment focused, meaning it was a way to help people feel safe in the room while we explored deep emotional experiences together. And people got well in a way that I wasn't experiencing in my psychoanalytic ways of working. Mm. Um, and so as, as my colleagues and I learned this method, uh, was sort of young back in 2004, and people got better, and people who had had other forms of therapy came to me, and they got well, and, and all the, the therapists practicing this got well, that it just became a kind of a growing pet peeve of mine that this information didn't translate out to mainstream, to the public. And so that's what brought me to start writing about it without any jargon, kind of taking, using science, the scientific uh, work and studies and practice and phenomenology of how emotions work and sharing it with the public in a way that was not dumbed down but accessible and easy to understand and and practical most importantly what do we do when we have an emotion uh, what happens when we bury emotions like we're taught to do in our culture and um, how can we all feel better using 
one learning some basic education, even if you don't use it, to understand ourselves better? And then how can we implement small practices in our lives so that we feel just more connected and um, more full and confident and calm and all these things that happen when people get in touch with emotions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I and what I started saying as I teach this, um, you know, out when I do seminars and when I write about this, I've really started to clarify that getting in touch with emotions does not mean wearing your heart on your sleeve. It's not an excuse for bad behavior for acting out. That's not what we're talking about. You know, crying at work or or being mean at home when you're angry. What we're talking about is bringing into balance that we're too much in our heads and our thoughts in our society because that's what we're sort of taught to do mind over matter mm -hmm. and pick yourself up by your bootstraps but this is about just coming into balance so that we're head and heart and how to use them both together uh, to really thrive in life and and for well-being and there is a lot to learn that just we should be getting in high school and we don't yeah so, i mean we were having a brief conversation before we yeah. started this class about how, right, our society seems to be not, right, we're not, definitely not educating our children, right, in like emotions and like, think about like, I think about, you know, like God raising the girls and, you know, Ike's, Ike's girls, my stepdaughters, and how much we talk about how they're feeling and how some of our friends have charts of emotions on their wall for their kids to like, right, recognize and see and be able to realize, oh, I'm feeling sad right now. I'm feeling angry right now, but it's not mainstream clearly right? Right. but there is a change in the tide and the zeitgeist is changing which is I think why I was asked to write a book on um, mm -hmm. this right? that would not have happened I think 20 years ago right like mm -mm. yeah 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 but, uh, there's enough information coming out there about tra trauma informed thinking right which is this idea that our experiences affect us for better and for worse and that we are wired our brain from the moment we're born is wiring as we are having experiences. And when we have good experiences, uh, it's calming for us and, and we go forward and feel curious and can engage with the world. And when we have bad experiences, it activates parts of the brain that keep us more insular, that create more anxiety, and that ultimately can create um, depression and all sorts of symptoms. And so the more we understand not only how to be parents, but how to be humans in the world and how to treat ourselves and, and treat others, the more we can grow our collective well-being together. Right. So the basic education is just so crucial to know, uh, particularly parents. You know, I, if, I, if I had read the book that I wrote, it would have spared, I think, my children um, a lot of mistakes that I made mm -hmm. unwittingly, right? Parents, 99% of parents have wonderful intent. But like you said, if you don't know what you don't know, right. uh, what can you do? And also people who are suffering from anxiety, depression, and personality disorders, eating disorders, also, you know, the full gamut of diagnoses have a, an experiential basis, right? It's like if you figure we don't know what part is nature, one nurture, let's just figure 50% comes from each as a uh, not knowing. But we know mm -hmm. that, that uh, both genetics and experience matters, and we might as well be armed with education so that we have some, some power to affect uh, our lives. Mm -hmm. And without emotion education, it is very difficult because those are the puppet strings pulling from us behind the scenes, and we think it's all you know, we can control what's going on in our thoughts. And it's just, it's not so because of the way the brain is structured and organized and, and works. Mm -hmm. So, so I want to touch on obviously the change triangle really soon here, but quick question. So you mentioned trauma just briefly, and I know obviously that's a big part of your work. And we have a lot of people, we did an event not long ago called Healing from Childhood Trauma. So we have a lot of people watching right now who have come from really rough childhoods and have had trauma. So I'd love it if you could just kind of give a, a little overview about the link between trauma and things like anxiety and depression and you know wrap it into obviously the emotional conversation too right it's really the whole enchilada so the the first thing that a lot of people don't know right because how could they we don't we don't get this education is that the word trauma means a lot of things to different people so if we asked you know 10 people to define trauma 
um, we would get different definitions. But the majority of people think of a, a major catastrophic event happening, and that is in fact trauma, right? Something happens um, and it, it changes the brain for, for, for the worse, right? We are forever changed, like a, uh, a, being a victim of a violent crime or witnessing a violent crime. Uh, and overt abuse, uh, child abuse, and overt neglect. What I want to add into it is that there, there's all this invisible trauma that's going on that we're not acknowledging, which is a seemingly lovely family, right? Because people do not speak honestly yet. Uh, there's still a lot of shame about what it means to actually be human. For example, that everybody suffers, mm -hmm. just part of being human. But so um, a lot of the people that come into my practice come from families that look fine. Um, you know, both two successful parents and the client or patient comes in wondering, why am I so anxious and depressed? What is wrong with me? And so there's this other type of trauma where there's small but consistent um, lack of acknowledgement, uh, kind of an emotional aloneness, or uh, a, uh, a really like, um, how can I say it? The, the true aspects of a person's authentic self, a child, are, t are taught that they're bad. So for example, um, let's say I come from a very academic family and I'm not good at school. And my parents get scared because all they knew is that education was the way, right? So I'm from a Jewish mm -hmm. family in New York. It's all about education. And so if you are not good at school, let's say you're an artist and you're not an, you're an artist because genetically you're just born that way. We are all born unique individuals, not necessarily like our family or like our parents. And so if you're repeatedly told that there's something wrong with you and you're sent to doctors, why is my kid not doing well in school? Why can't my kid focus? Why can't my kid sit still? The kid then starts to develop a sense that there's something wrong with me and develops a shame. And then that turns into anxiety and depression, but it's really shame that needs to be addressed and treated. And shame is one of those important emotions that, we don't talk about enough, even mentioning the word shame can begin, begin to bring on a feeling of shame. And so mm -hmm. for people watching right now, you know, if you notice that you're getting squirmy or uncomfortable, one, just validate that that is normal. Um, and maybe take a minute to put your feet on the ground and, and take a deep breath. But really what shame is, is an excruciating inward withdrawing, a feeling of getting small, when we are, when our exuberance or our emotions with energy coming outward is met with a, that's bad. Um, it could be a nonverbal expression. It can be an overt verbal expression. And with repeated squashing of a person's true self, true authentic self, um, they, they develop symptoms of traumatic stress and trauma. And so we really need to, expand the definition of trauma where the person who is experiencing the symptoms later on in life understands that there's a reason that they're anxious and depressed and it might not be so obvious and they can trail back really through the emotions um, where, where, they, where one feels that it's not okay to be who they are. Mm -hmm. mm. And I totally, right. I get how that can so tie into emotions. And if we feel exuberant, right, or feel excited, and then uh, dad or mom comes home and they're upset, they've had a bad day or something, and that is not, right, that's depressed, that's put down, that's, you know, squashed, as in kids be quiet, I've had a rough day and I need to relax, you know, even like those kinds of things. Exactly, right? And, and listening to that, well, it's like, of course that's going to happen. Parents are tired. It's really the repeated happening of that. And when parents are constantly squashing their children's expression without any repair or acknowledgement that, oh, so sorry that I did that. Now come and tell me, you know, what, what mm -hmm. happened. 
day. Um, and, and the parent being able to say, oh, I was just in a terrible mood this morning and right. I'm so sorry. Um, that, that over time really limits the way that a person can be and to keep those emotions and exuberance, you know, even sadness and anger, right? We need to create safe spaces for these feelings and channel them into constructive behaviors. Mm -hmm. So learning how emotions work and how to be with them what on our own and also how to teach others how to be with our emotions in a way that mm -hmm. is healthy for us is just something we're not getting in, in any type of formal schooling or even therapists aren't getting emotion education. And mm -hmm. so I'm really on a mission to just give some, deliver some basic information that's out there mm -hmm. uh, that isn't translating because our culture is still fearful of mm -hmm. emotional sight. Mm -hmm. And in a way, rightfully so, right? Because what emotions look like from the outside, people who grew up in violent homes, um, you think anger is about, let's say, hitting or abuse, emotional abuse, mm -hmm. um, narcissistic abuse, putting someone down, um, a whole host of ways that anger is expressed. But that's not what anger is. That's, that's, that is the destructive expression of anger. Mm -hmm. And what we want to teach people is that experience anger, experiencing our anger is a wholly internal experience, learning to listen to it. And it's telling us something important. It's really um, what's not going well outside and what needs to be changed. And then the last step is how to use that, that anger to change the situation. If we think of anger as a catalyst for creating positive change, like mm -hmm. saying, I don't like the way you just spoke to me, or that's not okay that you do this, or I don't want to go to that event, or you know, setting limits and boundaries, or just putting it in your backbone and saying no to something. Mm -hmm. uh, or leaving, knowing that that's time to leave a situation where you're being mistreated and somebody has no desire to change. Um, or stop their behavior that's destructive. Mm. And of course, these are all very painful things to deal with, right. um, but get you to a better place to live a, a happier life, mm. or at least a, a calmer life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Awesome. Thank you. So so can we dive into the change triangle and, and talk a little bit about that as it relates to anxiety and depression? And I, I know you also have a, a screen share you want to do so you can show people too. Yes, I think that's great. So I, I'll screen share. Also, um, anyone that is um, wants to can just Google the change triangle right now. There's a couple of different renditions of it. Uh, and um, on on my website, which is hillaryjacobshendel.com, in the toolbox, you can pick up, you can look at the change triangle while I'm doing it if the screen share, um, you know, if you'd rather have, have it in a different format. But I will put it up. Uh, Let's see if I can do this. Technology. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Do oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so in a nutshell, what you can do, and I just want to say that the change triangle for some people see it and it resonates immediately like it did for me. For my husband, he'll say it took him 10 years to really under, understand it. But there's a, you practice as you get there because this is a, a practice. It's a, it's, a, it's a living, working, moving map and tool um, where we are working our way around the triangle all the time throughout the day. And on a bigger macro level, we're working um, around it through our lives. And I'll go through the three corners of the triangle and then what's underneath it, which is this excellent place called the open-hearted state of the authentic self, where most of us want to spend more time. And uh, we can use this to explain how trauma happens and anxiety and depression happens and how we also heal. So it's a very practical, uh, useful map. And I teach this to all my patients in my, in my sessions, my AEDP sessions, all my sessions. So... One way to think of this is if you take this triangle and you superimpose it on your body, so the point of the triangle is really somewhere around your belly button, and then it kind of comes up and out, so the top of the triangle, let's say, is somewhere above your shoulders, between your head and your shoulders. Mm. And the reason uh, it helps to visualize it that way is because if we start from the bottom of the triangle, um, which is sort of where it all begins, these core emotions, these are physical experiences, right? And that was the first aha moment for me. Like, what? 
emotions or physical experiences. But once that someone mentioned that, I was like, oh yeah, of course they are, right? Because when we feel anything, it may, it may seem like we're having it up in our head and our mind, but as you start to slowly scan your body below the neck, what's happening is that all emotions create a cascade of, an, an, of physical experiences and that's their purpose. So let me go over each of the corners of the triangle and, um, and then we can like play with it on, um, on how we go up and down. So basically these core emotions, which I'm talking about seven of them, right? There are other emotions and different scientists describe, may add one or two, but what I put in the change triangle are the emotions that really kind of cause us the most trouble when we're not with them, when they get blocked. And so these are the seven core emotions that are very practical to, to understand and work with in ourselves and or with a counselor or with a friend um, that we can, we can share emotional experiences together. Uh, unbeknownst to many people and, and have it be fine. So um, they're f the core emotions are fear, anger, grief or sadness, right? joy, excitement, disgust, and sexual excitement. And what happens is the way core emotions work, and Darwin really talked about these in the beginning uh, of the you know the turn of the century of the of the 1900s. So this is nothing new. It's just new to most people in in modern society. Something happens in the environment. So let's take um, let's take just sort of the obvious example that I use uh, a lot. Um, let's say um, a wild dog was to burst into the room where you and I are right now, Andy, or where mm -hmm. everybody is there. Um, our, our eyes, our five senses are picking up that there's some danger coming at us, right? We see the wild dog, we might hear the growls, um, we might even, uh, you know, get a sense that something is in, our, is in our periphery, but the five senses pick up the environment and it transmits into our brain, the middle of the brain where there is no conscious control. And I'm wondering, can you see if I hold up something else or are we just with these? Um, yeah, we can. So there's a, our screens are off to the right. So yeah, you, you should be able to, we should be able to see whatever you're holding. Okay. So let me know if you can see, this is a picture of a, of the, of a cross section of a brain. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. And so what happens is um, the incoming information comes in from the environment and it affects this, limbic system here, which is the emotional system of the brain. And it's from here, before we know what's happening, let's say we're talking about fear now with a dog, the, the limbic system, which is connected to the lower parts of the brain, which are connected to the entire body through a large nerve because the vagus, called the vagus nerve, sends signals down to all the organs of the body and the job of this is to ready our body for an action that is adaptive for survival. Mm. Um, that's why we have emotions, right? They're all about getting us to move in ways that help us survive and thrive in life. So in this, in fear, it gets our blood vessels dilated so that we can run. It causes our heart to race. It changes our breathing. Um, it changes our stomach so that we switch from a, a, a digestion ready, relaxed mode to, you know, pushing blood into the arms and the legs to get us ready to run and possibly fight, you know, fight and flight survival mechanisms. Okay. So the wild dog comes into the room and we, we make a mad dash out of the room to protect ourselves. This is all before we have any clue that we're having an emotion. And the reason that's important, so we run to safety, for example, in this example, and it's only then our heart's racing, we're like looking around to make sure the danger is over. And then we can register that, oh my gosh, this terrible thing happened and I'm having this emotion called fear. Now, the reason that's important is because we are taught, uh, one of the biggest myths in our culture is that we are supposed to be able to control if we have emotions. And if we have emotions, we are weak and that there's something wrong with us and we should just be able to get over it and mind over matter and pull yourself, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. So it's, it's just not true that emotions happen. They get triggered and 
then we know that we're having them, and then we can exert some control from the, the cerebral cortex where we exert control over what we're feeling and we have um, the ability to do different things with emotions to deal with them. So that's like really important. So when we're born, going back to the change triangle, newborn babies are wired with the ability from the get-go to have fear, anger, grief, joy, excitement, disgust, sexual excitement, everything is wired. And each of those emotions has their own program, so to speak, like a computer program. So that when I feel angry, it sets up, it affects different organs in the body that are ready for me to attack, right? I may want to attack verbally. I may want to attack with my fists. I may want to kick with my legs and everyone's different. And in trauma, you'll see as we're with the body, the body will tell us what we need to do to heal trauma. We are ready from the get-go for also healing if we just remove obstacles. So the important thing to know about core emotions is that we come out, we're wired for them. Um, what a core emotion is, is a constellation of physical experiences that have an impulse for adaptive action. And that's pretty much what an emotion is. Mm -hmm. Now, emotions are important for survival, but even more important for survival is that we get along and feel connected to our, our primary caregivers, mm -hmm. and then our families at large, and then our peers in school, and then our groups, right? Humans are wired for connection. And so if the core emotions are what's good for me and me only, the inhibitory emotions are what is good for me getting along. Mm. And so from the get-go, little children learn an 85% or so nonverbal communication with the mother and other primary caregivers. What emotional expressions are okay, meaning what keep me connected to my mom? So when I smile and look happy, one mom may love that and smile back. Another mom who had some trauma in her childhood and um, may get angry at, at happy expressions might show an angry face. And this is all infant mother research, incredible videos slowing down of micro moments of the coordination between infants and mothers. But we start to learn what emotions are okay and what aren't. And so let's Let's give an example, like before, of a kid, a two-year-old kid that is exuberant, mommy, 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 look at me, and a mom in a moment of, uh, let's say, their own depression or their own agitation um, is like, get away from me. Uh, the kid then moves up the change triangle, right, into these inhibitory emotions because it sends a message to the brain if I am exuberant, right, and there's nothing more painful than having this all this outward energy coming towards a loved other and having it be rejected, that it says to the brain, this emotion is not safe. And from then on, it, be, it sends a signal before it comes up that the brain blocks this emotion and, and pushes it down with these three inhibitory emotions, either anxiety, shame, or guilt. And they, and they work in different ways. And why one, you know, why you experience one or the other or all three or a blend of two is unique for everyone, but they all function to inhibit our core emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And because the mix of these core emotions in the body and these inhibitory emotions feels so awful, we move up, you know, we're moving up the change triangle now to the left side to defenses which is anything we do to avoid feeling emotional pain. And defenses also have gotten a bad rap. In psychoanalytic training, we always thought of defenses as this kind of bad thing that patients were doing that we were to really overcome. And yes, defenses, when they started, really, really help us. We need to, you know, in therapy, I'm appreciating with my patients their defenses, right? Wow, you know, if you didn't start... Um, you know, spacing out, or if you didn't develop your eating disorder, you, you would have just gone crazy, right? This, this particular defense, which turns into diagnoses, and depression is one of them, um, at the time we have them serve us. But what happens is these defenses become outdated. And as we become adults, 
um, they start to cost us more than they help us. And so we want to ultimately replace our defenses, the ways that we deal with painful emotions, with adaptive ways of working with emotions, which is what which is everything that I'm teaching. How do we work with emotions so that we can go through them and come out the other side as opposed to blocking them where we start to feel worse ultimately, disconnected from our vitality and, and who we are. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea is that we we have these emotions, they come up, you know, from our body, and then when they're not allowed, we move up into these inhibitory and defensive states of, of being, and that's where most of us are living our lives, truthfully, right. in the world, on the top of the triangle. Right. And, and this is how it works with trauma, that when we have trauma, we're moving up and around the triangle. And um, little traumas or big traumas, it's all about blocking these intense, like in a catastrophic trauma, uh, let's just say uh, a rape or being sexually abused or being physically abused, right? If somebody hurts us, it's going to mobilize a tremendous amount of rage and fear and sadness. And that energy wants to come up and out and do its thing. But if we are blocked from doing that, literally trapped because our life depends on it, there's this incredible amount of physical, biological energy Right? Not in the woo-woo California sense that I used to think of emotions and emotional energy, but in true biological energy, the way our mitochondria and our cells are creating energy and temperature so that we, um, our heart beats and we breathe and, and we can move. So this energy becomes blocked and thwarted and puts stress like a pressure cooker on all the organs in the body and on the mind, and it causes the mind to distort itself in, in many different ways to develop character symptoms and all sorts of other uh, symptoms and diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense, Andy? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's that's very, yeah. very powerful. And I was, I was just thinking like while you were talking about it, um, like, so, you know, we use the example of, right, the child who is exuberant and the mom that's tired and, you know, mm -hmm. saying, you know, I, be quiet or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So what about, like, can we, I'm imagining, I guess, in this moment, it can also be, like, a thought that we have that can depress an emotion. Like, let's say, like, sex, sexual excitement, because, right, so many people have shame around that. That's such a big mm -hmm. topic of, that shame te tends to come into the equation. So, let's say someone has some sexual excitement, maybe they're attracted to somebody and then they have a thought and their thought is like, oh, that's wrong, I'm married or, you know, like things like that. Yes. Like, does that also create this, like going up into the inhibitory emotions and, and then defending and all that stuff? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and that's, you know, because CBT is so popular and mainstream and, and that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, <laughs> You know, because we gravitate towards thoughts, and and um, and there's money put behind that. That um, uh, so, I, and I think CBT is is great, and I think it's. But you need both pieces. You need the, mm -hmm. the, the thoughts and the body and emotions and working together for optimal therapy and for optimal growth and self help. But yes, but the the thing about that is that before we had the internal thought, it came from shaming messages and right. society from religion um, and I have no problem with religion when it's when it's for constructive right to help people um, be kind and good and to help other people uh, but there's so many sort of again these shoulds on how we should be that are counter to human nature um, sex is not bad being sexually excited isn't bad cheating on your partner when you've made an agreement not to do that not good. It, it, it right. structures the relationship, but having an agreement that you can um, explore sexual um, ways of being and you both, it's based in trust and communication, not a problem as far as I'm concerned. So all these, um, all these emotions can be triggered by negative thoughts, but those thoughts originate outside of us first. We, we learn them from our first our, our families and then the culture at large. And so we have to become conscious of the messages so that we can question them. So for example, I worked with someone where they had a, a fa familial message that divorce is bad and they felt very ashamed about getting divorced. And, and so we, we looked at that. Um, you shouldn't get divorced. Really? Can we, can we take a look at that should? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't you? Where did you learn that? What are the reasons? If your parents taught you that, what, what were their reasons? Where did they learn that? What, is, what does it mean to them to be divorced? Um, 
those type of, uh, of, of notions in the culture that tell us that we're bad and that get internalized for no reason and it hurts us dearly. Now, what I should say is that there are reasons to internalize. So there's, I, I talk about um, that there's good shame and, or healthy shame and toxic shame. There's healthy guilt and toxic guilt, right? Yeah. Shame and guilt are important affects, emotions that were put there uh, evolutionarily for good, to, to so, so that we behave in ways that are civilized towards others, right? If we kill somebody, we better feel ashamed of ourselves and we better feel guilty because otherwise we're a sociopath. And if we had a world filled with sociopaths, it would, you know, we would all be killing each other and stealing from each other and, and raping and, you know, pillaging. Not so good. Right. And, uh, that's where, you know, emotions get their bad rap because uh, without rule of law and without ways to be that shame and guilt are part of, um, then it's a free for all. And above all, the guiding light of all this is that we need to behave constructively. Whatever we do out in the world must be constructive for me, for the other, and um, the best that we can do that. Mm. So let me just go to this place underneath the chart. The, yeah, the, yes. Called the open hearted state. So the idea is that right now as adults and and um when people come into my office and people watching this who are on the top of the triangle we want to be able to work our way back down to get to know our defenses so that we can move them aside and get to know what are the emotions underneath them to transform anxiety shame and guilt lower it so that we have access to the original emotions and our emotions in the moment that come up when we are hurt um, or when we love somebody or when we want something, right, that keep us vital in life. Because core emotions are this, this special, as I've said, um, are these special experiences that not only when they're blocked lead to problems, but when we can connect to them and move through them, which I explain, which I'm happy to explain here briefly, but I explain and then show ad nauseum in, uh, in the book that I wrote, right? Because we need, nobody is taught skills to befriend their emotions and move through them in a way that feels good at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of step-by-step -step skills we can learn and practice over a lifetime. But when we go through our emotions, which has to do with tuning into how they feel in the body, and letting them move through. They're kind of wave-like in nature. They have a beginning and an end. And at the end of riding a full wave of a core motion, and maybe some people can relate, when you have a good cry over something and you feel better at the end, and it's like, whew, I really needed that. Um, then it regulates, which is a little bit of jargon, which I try not to use, but it basically regulates and calms and lowers the arousal of the tension in the mind and body and brings us into this calm state where we connect to our, our true self and have access to our feelings. It's a place where we can feel what we're feeling, think about what we're feeling and how to deal with it and relate positively all at the same time. Mm. And, in the, and that's the goal, right? So that I know what I feel, I can think about what I'm feeling and, just, and share it and talk about it or work through it and connect to someone in a positive way, even if I'm saying things that are hard for them to hear or hard for me to share. And when we are in this state, the reason that the markers that were there are through these C words that I, um, that I love and that I read about first with Richard Schwartz and his work in internal family systems therapy, and I write about him and his work in my book as well, um, that is for the public uh, by the way, not just for therapists. And, um, the, and these C words are calm. So when we're calm, when we're curious, when we feel connected to ourselves, not like a talking head, but embodied and connected to others, when we feel compassionate and can access compassion towards ourselves for our pain and suffering, even if it's when we're angry, because feeling angry is also a painful experience. And it's, a, it's upsetting to be angry, particularly at somebody you love and care about, like your child or your partner or your friend. Um, we tend to feel confident in this open-hearted state of the authentic self, 
courageous to meet the challenges, right? To do things even though we're frightened, that it doesn't paralyze us and clear. And some people would add creativity also as a byproduct of, of this state, even though many people are creative from their pain and, and defenses, which is why I didn't, I didn't put it on the change triangle map mm -hmm. that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we want to work our way back down into that state, not where we spend all our time, because that's impossible because we're human and things come up in life that cause us stress and anxiety, but where we have, where we can get back to reliably more and more and spend more of our baseline time in that open-hearted state of the authentic self because it just feels good it's relaxing and empowering mm, i love it thank you this is awesome i i'm i'm so glad you have this like um image in front of us too so we can have this representation of of, of seeing it and everyone again you can go uh look at this on on your website and stuff too so i appreciate that that really i think it helps me especially i'm a very visual person so i like to be able to you know see the steps of something and, and how it works so i thought that was great thank you yeah you're so welcome i have another visual that i brought with me that seems to help but the thing about emotions is that you can't think your way through an emotion, which is what makes it difficult mm -hmm. to communicate. And even a graphic like the change triangle, right? It's just a two dimensional sort of unrich representation. What really is important here are individual stories of what it means to, to experience a feeling and what it means to block a feeling. And it's through the stories that I write about again and again, always different stories from my practice and from my personal life that I want to let people know. So if this feels sort of flat, it is flat. Um, it's really bringing examples. Like if we had more time, you know, we could really sort of do a demonstration of, of, of what that means from a self-help perspective. But I wanted to let people know that um, um, in the book, which is located in the library, it, it, as well as you can buy, but a lot of people can't afford and don't want to buy books um, to get it at the library. And then there's all these resources on my website um, and my blog particularly are stories of what this looks like working the change triangle mm -hmm. with a safe other or on your own or little experiments to try where you get out of your head for a moment and have an experience, right? right. There's something I put on, I have a, a YouTube channel um, called the Change Triangle Channel. And I try to put up these experiential exercises. There's one that's called Dropping Into the Body. And it just gives you a taste, right? How to have a gentle, safe taste of what it means to surrender a little bit to getting out of the head, which is where we feel safe, and to feeling these weird sensations that emotions cause, but they're not going to... Um, they're just feelings that are coming up that when we can get used to f sensing them and we can tolerate sensing them, it's a game changer for not having to run away from our emotions and then move up the change triangle into anxiety and defense. Mm. And I think of depression because a lot of people are watching how to recover from depression. Depression is a defense in a way that it is a massive shutdown so we don't feel uh, our primary feelings. And often, you know, rage, anger and rage are a big um, culprit in depression that we, we, there's no, there was no safe place to express our anger. And so it kind of gets folded in, imploded against the self, and then this kind of massive shutdown. So we go kind of numb and um, the serotonin levels drop and we feel exhausted and we can't eat or we eat too much. And um, it's really interesting the way that the defenses work to create um, this blockage mm -hmm. to feel even a sense of boredom, right? Can be because mm -hmm. we're deadened because we're cut off from our emotions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Like all this, there's like so much here and I know that we don't have much, much time left, but if, if people, I highly recommend, so there's going to be buttons below and the link over to your website, Hillary. Um, is there anything specific that you want people to look at besides what you just mentioned um, as resources, free stuff people can uh, take advantage of? Yeah, well, everything that I do is free. This is like my, my bread and butter is my psychotherapy practice and sharing the change triangle with the public and trying to present it in a way that ha like takes all the jargon and the psychobabble, you know, BS that's so annoying out of it. And so the website and the 
the, my website, I would just encourage people to go and poke around. The blog has lots of stories. I address different emotions. I talk about trauma. I talk about relationships. I talk about parenting. Everything is free. The Change Triangle YouTube, there's not even ads on my, um, uh, on my videos. It's just, and I take requests. And I'd love it if people were interested. You can stay connected to me um, by signing up for my email list. I have a blog. And since I don't, I don't believe in kind of like inundating an email, like a people's mailbox, I don't like when people do that to me. So I just send one new article once a month. And then the full enchilada is really in the book, It's Not Always Depression, where I, I have seven stories working through social anxiety, working through grief with someone whose parents died when they were young, um, working through um, traumas, right? These small T uh, traumas, um, not that they're smaller than any big, but this is how people refer to them in the trauma world, these kind of transgressions that, that are invisible and people come in with anxiety and depression, but really uh, it's not about medicating them and it's not about mind over matter, it's about getting in touch with the emotions. And so the book shows that, so you have a vicarious experience with then gentle exercises so it's kind of, it's a personal growth book. It's a self-help book. But even if you don't want to get in touch with your own emotions, the, the intellectual education will help you feel better about yourself and understand yourself to help break stigmas and judgments and all sorts of misinformation out there about emotions. Mm. And I encourage people to read the book together with their loved ones, um, to read it in groups, to bring it to their therapist who probably doesn't know about AEDP and this way of working. And just it's just meant to be a resource. And hopefully the book is available at everyone's local library. And if not, they can ask for it. And it's available in audio. So these are all the resources. My email is on the footer of my website. And if people want to email me to make requests that I write about certain things um, or they need referrals for therapists, um, and they can also investigate the AEDP Institute website, uh, which is the therapy version of, um, for therapists who want to understand more about this way of working. Awesome. Thank you. You have like so much, so much great stuff. So I highly recommend everyone you click the, the button or link below and head on over to Hillary's website and, and, and go spend some time there. Obviously, you have so much amazing content for people to take advantage of. Are there any last insights, any last little tidbit you want to leave people with before we wrap up? Just that this information changed and really saved my life and thousands of other people. And the, the, I get emails every day from people who read this stuff on how helpful it is. And um, I just encourage people to learn, right? Don't be afraid just to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to meet all of you out there and um, to meet you, Andy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a, a pleasure and a joy. I guess if there's one takeaway, just know that emotions just are. You're not bad or weak for having them. And that emotions are physical and they're supposed to be and that if you can get to know yourself in ever deepening ways as a lifelong process it's only gonna it's only gonna help mm, i love it thank you i love a perfect wrap up and thank you for <laughs> for being here and for doing this hillary and everyone just thank you so much for showing up for yourself i say this at the end of most classes and it, it this this is the number one step you got to show up for yourself and you're here watching you're here listening and that is just awesome so we love you and thank you so much for for being here for yourself and we will see you on the next one take care everybody Hey everyone, I just finished another great class with Hillary Jacobs Hendel. She talked with us about overcoming depression and anxiety using the change triangle tool for emotional health. So I really loved first off that, that she showed us this change triangle tool. She screen shared for us so that we could see what was going on and really get a uh, visual representation of how how our emotions come to us, what kind of a cycle that we follow when we are avoiding emotions or depressing emotions, all those kinds of things. So I thought that was really powerful. I hope you liked it as well. Um, I wanted to go through that. So one of the main takeaways that I had was when Hillary said that you can't think your way through an emotion, right? She is very passionate about 
how we need to be present to emotions, that, that emotions are not bad, they're not good, they're not anything, they just are, right? We are human beings and we have human emotions. That is part of being human here. And these are just things that if we want to better learn more about ourselves, learn to truly love and accept ourselves and um, really get a handle on who we are, we need to learn about our emotions. This is part of who we are. So, so she talked about many different aspects on this um, change triangle. So the first one being our core emotions, right? She mentioned that we are wired for core emotions. We are born into this world as infants, wired for these core emotions. These core emotions are supposed to protect us in our life. They're supposed to um, trigger action in our life. So if we're feeling different things, it, it makes us do different things. Maybe it's we feel, feel a certain way, makes us cry when we're a baby. And so our mom comes and feeds us, all those kinds of things. So so she mentioned that emotions are like each of them have an actual like computer program, right? Leading to different actions in our life. And then she talked about inhibitory emotions, right? So the core emotions were down here, inhibitory emotions were up here on the triangle. And this is, this is, she mentioned, right? Like what's good for me getting along with others, right? So we talked about this example of a child being happy, right? Exuberant, excited. Maybe they're being loud and happy and joyfully, you know, going about whatever play they're a part of. And the mother says, right, be quiet or I'm tired or go to your room or what have you. Mom's had a bad day. She's exhausted. She's um, saying this to her child. So that can lead that child into these inhibitory emotions like anxiety, like shame, like guilt, right? And so then you're up over here in this in inhibitory emotion section of the change triangle. And then she talked about defenses, which is over here. And these are the things that we do to avoid emotions entirely, right? And initially a defense like this serves us, right? In the moment it serves us as in it helps us survive whatever we're going through of the moment. Maybe it's a traumatic childhood. So this defense serves us in surviving. However, if we keep carrying them with us in life, they no longer serve us, right? And she was mentioning that most of us as humans live here. We are avoiding emotions. We are depressing how we truly feel all our emotions. We're depressing them down and we are living in this space of defense, so she talked about the place that we want to get back to, the place we want to visit more often and stay in more often is this open-hearted state. This is this state of who we really are, how we are being our authentic self, right? So working our way back here, and, and she mentioned how we do that is we allow our core emotions to move through us when we experience a core emotion like anger or sadness or, or joy, allowing ourselves to have that emotion and let that energy move through us. Uh, emotions are energy in motion, right? So this brings us into a calm, peaceful state where we are connected with who we are, we're com compassionate, we're loving, all of those kinds of things. So that's kind of like just a brief overview of what she guided us through with this change triangle. So again, I highly recommend you check out Hillary's work further if you're interested. It sounds like she has many many, many, many free resources that you can dive into over on her website, her blog, um, handouts like this with the change triangle, what have you. So thank you so much as always for tuning in and for showing up for yourself. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.